So welcome everyone. Great to see you. Good to be together again. Um, if you just happen to find this out of nowhere, um, this is um, this is our Sunday morning meditation class. I'm Hugh Byrne, and I'm a teacher with the Insight Meditation Community Washington IMCW and the Center for Mindful Living (CML), which is part of IMCW. We're going to the complex history right now, but uh, but we're uh, you know very as you'll hear at the end with the announcements, uh, very very active community, both online and more now in, in person again um, for different events and things. So we share information at the end about that. Um, but welcome. Um, and lots of things. I was just saying before that um, happy Juneteenth um, to well, pretty much most of us are here in the United States. Kerry and well, Heather lives in the U.S., but Heather um, in Canada, but um, maybe one or two others. But um, so, so folks, hopefully, are somewhat familiar with Juneteenth. But the uh, June nineteenth, the the day that um, the final, if you like, the emancipation of enslaved people, African Americans, who since the Civil War was still going on, even though emancipation, as Cassie would no doubt be able to tell us a lot about um, what happened on uh, January 1st of 1863, because the war, the Civil War was still going on, that it wasn't until, finally, till June 19th of 1865 that I think it was in Galveston, Texas, the proclamation was read and the final, I think, two, 250,000 enslaved uh, people in Texas were were freed, you know, so that it, it became not just in theory, but in, in practice. And um, so it's really great that it's wonderful that it's now, from being an African-American celebration, it's now a, a national, national holiday, which is... Um, hopefully a sign of um of the arc of history um bending towards uh bending towards justice while there's a lot of other things going on that kind of maybe calls that a bit more into question but um but hopefully that that's uh, you know that's something we can really celebrate um happy father's day to all the um um all the fathers and a uh, good day to think about our own fathers and um you know, whatever our relationship was with them. And I've shared in uh, in uh, one or two talks in the last few months how I've, you know, found it possible to kind of get into a much better relationship with my dad who died more than 40 years ago, but I carried a lot of, you know, a lot of judgment in my head around and, and, and to let that go was um, it's a nice, you know, these teachings are very helpful in terms of uh, letting go of suffering, and you know, not that it's easy, but um, but but that was really a, a really freeing thing. And it's, I can look back on him with much less, kind of much more, just you know, love and gratitude, and you know, acknowledge you know, life. People make choices, and you know, life unfolds, and um, you know, we may not agree with everything that people have done, but we can hold them in our in our hearts fully. And so, um, so it, it's a good day to uh, it's a good day to practice gratitude um, to fathers and um, fathers generally. Um, and uh, I have a special edition as well today. It's my my mother's birthday, so it's also you know br bringing her in. Uh, she was born 96 years ago um, and uh, died nearly five years ago. And uh, I, you know, as you know, many of you know, I, I have wonderful memories and gr great gratitude to her for, for her life and, and all that she gave to her. Our family, nine kids and 20 grandkids and growing number of great grandkids and stuff. So really she's very much in my, in my mind and in my heart today. And so lovely, lovely to be, um, be together. And um, just a little bit about the, uh, the format of the class. We, we typically begin with a, with a meditation 
about 20 minutes or so just to kind of help us arrive and, and settle. And then uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give a talk and uh, maybe around 30 minutes or so. The theme today is some version of only this moment is life. Only this moment is life. Um, you know, the power of the power of the present moment, the present moment being the the only place where we suffer and where we can experience freedom. And, you know, the the great, you know, benefits of the teachings that that help us to free ourselves from suffering. And it's always through our present moment experience, through bringing awareness to the body, the heart, the mind, environment, right here, right now. So more on that. And then uh, Emily will lead us in some movement. Thank you, Emily, as always, for your your generous um, movement and uh, always appreciate that. And then we'll have um, a little time for some uh, sharing, some questions, some, you know, whatever's coming up. And, um, and then short meditation and announcements to finish. And we, we, we um, endeavor to finish at 12 o'clock um, by 12 noon and to offer for those who would like to um, the opportunity to stay around it may be for 20 minutes or 30 minutes or so to share sometimes it might be in smaller groups sometimes it might be in the full group um, just share what's coming up and about our practice and whatever you know whatever's alive for us um, and so I'll, I'll plan to do that today. I think probably more in a, in a, in the full what whoever's still there in the full group and a discussion, um, um, rather than uh, smaller groups today. But we'll we'll come to that. Um, yeah. So that's that's our uh, that's our time today. And um, and uh, welcome welcome those joining us. Welcome Paddy. Welcome Arnie, and uh, Sarah all those who are joining us. So we'll, we'll begin with a, with a meditation. And you know, for most of us, most of you, it'd be kind of pretty familiar. It's kind of an invitation. It's an invitation very much to connect with our theme today of coming into, into the present moment, it's experiencing whatever's alive, whatever's present here and now. So I take a few moments to just settle into a comfortable, relaxed posture. So sitting with your back straight, maybe invite the shoulders to relax. Let your chest be open so you can breathe easily. You might let your hands rest in your in your lap or on your knees or on your thighs. And if you're comfortable, you could let your eyes close, let your attention <clears throat> come inward. You know. No you know, we spend so much time with our, you know, our physical gaze going out, but also our attention in other ways going outward, looking, focusing, listening in, and just inviting the attention more inward. So we're not excluding what's coming in from outside, but we're, we're also bringing in much more consciously our own inner experience of what's going on. You might take a few longer, deeper breaths to, 
to help yourself settle into being here, to, to be able to open as fully as you can to, to, what's, to what's present. Now, particularly if what's present is difficult or challenging. Relaxing, breathing in, calming the body, <clears throat> breathing out, calming the mind. <clears throat> Whenever you're ready, just letting the breath settle into its natural rhythm, breathing in, breathing out. Letting your attention rest in your body maybe feeling the weight of your body pressing down on your buttocks, on your thighs, maybe your feet touching the floor. So if you can feel your, your body from the inside, there may be some tension in the belly or the chest, maybe inviting a relaxing, a softening of anything that might feel, feel tense or tight, Letting go on the out breath. And let your present moment experience be the resting place for your awareness. Just opening to, to what is alive for you right now. What's present in the body, in the heart, in the mind. See if you can find peace in this moment with whatever is present for you right now. Peace can only be found, only experienced in the present moment. Otherwise, it's a, a thought, a memory, a hope. The line from Dorothy Hunt, pieces this moment without judgment, this moment in the heart space where everything that is is welcome. Can everything that's present right now be welcome? be allowed, be brought into awareness with kindness.
Maybe there's things going on in your life situation right now that are difficult or challenging or painful. Can you open to how those difficulties or challenges might be present in your body, in your emotions right now? Letting go of any story about what's happening or what people do, what you should do. But just this moment, what's here right now? Can you open to what's alive, what's present? Perhaps there's a feeling of calm or joy or gratitude. Can you just let yourself experience that feeling? <clears throat> Without any future or any past. It's just what's here right now. And the invitation is to open to whatever is present right now for you. Just to let it come. Let it be. Let it go when it's ready to go. Only this moment is life. And this moment life is always here in the now, in the present. past was now, when it was happening, the future, if and when it happens, will be now. So meeting this moment wholeheartedly, you know, in this moment we, we find freedom or we create or recreate suffering. We get tangled, we get hooked. We go into the future or the past. Or by bringing awareness to our experience and holding everything with kindness, we can untangle ourselves.
the breath can be a helpful support just to ground your awareness in the in the present in the here and now our breath is always in the present moment but often our minds are somewhere else we're worried about something and our breathing is tight and short can we come back again if it's helpful just let our attention rest in breath and the out breath And when the mind goes off and you notice that you're off somewhere else, you know, you're planning your day ahead or you're thinking about what you're going to do tomorrow or summer vacation or what happened in the week or whatever, you know, the way our minds get pulled into habitual patterns of thought, often patterns of suffering, we can just pause and come back, come back here. Because our mind was off in the past or in the future and away from now, away from this moment. So we just come back without judgment, with kindness, just here, now. T.S. Eliot says at the end of the four quartets, quick now, here, now, always. A condition of complete simplicity, costing not less than everything. He said earlier in the poem, I said to my soul, be still and wait without hope, <clears throat> for hope would be hope of the wrong thing. Wait without love, for love would be love of the wrong thing. There is yet faith, but the faith and the hope and the love are all in the waiting. Wait without thought for you are not ready for thought. So the darkness shall be the light and the stillness the dancing. It's holding whatever is present for you right now. with kindness, 
with acceptance. Just this moment, what's here right now, <clears throat> we only ever have to deal with the present moment. You know, when the mind goes to, but what about this? What if this happens? We can come back. Can I meet this moment and this moment? We can make plans and we can do what we need to do, but it's always this moment. How am I meeting this moment? Everything hangs on this knife edge of meeting this moment with presence, with awareness, or being somewhere else. And the the inspiration is that we can always come back. You know, it's not we're not failing when we when we do get caught up in anger or judgment or daydreams or whatever. We can just begin again. Always begin again. Here now. Condition of complete simplicity. I want to finish off um, with a poem by the uh, Irish poet from County Monaghan, Patrick Cavanaugh. It's called In Memory of My Mother. <clears throat> I do not think of you lying in the wet clay of a Monaghan graveyard. I see you walking down a lane among the poplars on your way to the station or happily going to second mass on a summer Sunday. You meet me and you say, don't forget to see about the cattle. Among your earthiest words, the angels stray. And I think of you walking along a headland of green oats in June, so full of repose, so rich with life. And I see us meeting at the end of a town on a fair day by accident after the bargains are all made and we can walk together through the shops and stores and markets, free in the oriental streets of thought. Oh, you are not lying in the wet clay, for it is a harvest evening now and we are pulling up the ricks against the moonlight and you smile up at us eternally.
So take your time coming, <coughs> excuse me, coming back into space, opening your eyes if they're closed, coming back into the group. And, and again, um, welcome to everyone. I hope that that was supportive. Um, you know, it connects very much with the, uh, the theme for today. And um, I kind of want to begin with, uh, with a story, and not really a story story, but just kind of a little background. Um, I've been, um, over recent sessions, I've, I've been doing some talks on kind of a path of practice to, to kind of find freedom from suffering. And I, I called five steps to freeing the heart or five steps to untangling the tangles of our lives, whichever you prefer. And, um, you know, one was, the first was turn towards your experience. The second was to open wholeheartedly to whatever is present. Third was to um, investigate suffering if there's suffering present you know and recognize it if there is fourth was to see you know recognize our own role in suffering as a buddha taught you know if we're suffering if there's suffering in the buddhist sense that there's some way in which we're clinging we're holding on we're craving there's something we're doing that is unskillful not to judge ourselves but to recognize that and then and then the fifth step that by being present with our experience, by opening fully and wholeheartedly, we can find our way out of suffering. You know, the, through mindfulness, we can get, get mindfulness gives rise to insight, to seeing clearly, which is freedom. It's seeing clearly where we're holding on, how we're holding on, how it's creating suffering, and letting go frees us from suffering. What? Well, what um, Robert Bayer in his book calls uh, seeing that frees, seeing that frees, you know, the awareness, the mindfulness that leads to the insight that frees us. So I was thinking about that and kind of, kind of closing that, um, th thinking about um, closing those kind of those five steps which I, it, we did um, last session or the one before. And, um, you know, I was thinking, well, for this week, what, what you know, what, what, what follows kind of naturally from that? And, and the theme that came to me was that, um, was, um, you know, how this moment and how we meet this moment, how it is, you know, at the very heart of, um, of our of our potential for freedom is at the very heart of the teachings it's the heart of our lives that that our life is always lived in the present moment and how we meet at the present moment really determines our our well-being our happiness our peace our freedom it all hang on how we meet this moment not what how we meet tomorrow's moment or when tomorrow's moment comes there will be how we meet that moment when tomorrow is here but not now you know as they said in the in the new testament bible christian bible the the you know have no thought for tomorrow as tomorrow for the things of tomorrow, you know, however that exactly went. Um, been a long time since I've read the New Testament, but that's a, that's a good one. Um, so the, the present, it's the present, everything really hangs on how we meet the present moment. And so, you know, there were teachings of um, that I've been talking about uh, quite a bit recently with um, uh, particularly Pema Chodron and her teachings about, you know, the Tibetan tradition of Shempa, you know, of how we get hooked, you know, and how we untangle ourselves, you know, learning to stay. And maybe I'll just kind of say a few words about that in a minute. But, um, you know, and I kind of went back to Gil Fronsdal's little book, um, The Issue at Hand, a lovely, lovely book, you know, short chapters on key Dharma themes, 
And he's got a lovely couple of chapters on being a naturalist. And I'll maybe say, say a few words about that. But it came to me very serendipitously, and this is my brief story, that um, one of the books that, you know, had the biggest impact on me in my spiritual life um, came out around the time I started teaching around 2000. And it, it came out came out in Canada. I think Canadians saw the possibility earlier than Americans in 1997 and then came out in 1999 in the US. And that was Eckhart Tolle's The Power of Now. The Power of Now. I, I, I imagine quite a few folks here have read The Power of Now. It's probably one of the one of the biggest, well, probably one of the books that have sold more in the spiritual marketplace, as it were. Um, and I remember reading around the time, and within a year or two, I think, of when it came out, how what an impact it had on me at that time. And I reflected just this over the last week or so of whenever I've recommended. Um, books to students, you know, maybe people starting up a practice or even people who maybe had a practice for a while but haven't kind of browsed too much in the spiritual marketplace, you know, ask, well, what are good books, you know? And, you know, they're ones I'd recommend, uh, you know, Jack Cornfield's The Path with Heart or The Wise Heart or Tara Brach's Radical Acceptance, Sharon Salzberg's um, um, loving kindness, uh, Zen mind, beginner's mind, you know, there'd be like half a dozen, but always, always in there is the power of now, you know? Um, and, and I, so I thought this week, oh, I'd, I'd like to go back and read it again. And so I've been reading it again, really the first time in at least, probably in at least a couple of decades. I've read snippets and parts, you know, over time and quoted from it, but actually reading it again. And it was, it's been a profound experience. It's been a powerful experience. And if you haven't read The Power of Now, I really encourage you to read it. If you have read it, and haven't read it for a while, I'd encourage you to go back and read it again. Because going back to read it again was like, it was like seeing it afresh and new. I mean, when something, when there's something that's wise, it's not like, oh, that book came out five years ago. So it's old, old history now, you know, yesterday's papers, you know. I mean, the Buddhist teachings are 2,600 years old, and they're as you know, they come down in their particular form from the society and the culture, etc. But they're as powerful today, I think, as they were when the Buddha was teaching. And similar, any, similarly, any any wisdom, um, you know, wise teachings will be wise wherever, you know, whenever or wherever, you know. Um, because wisdom doesn't change over time, you know. We, humanity, you know, hundred years how what the extraordinary changes from the time of the buddha or the time of moses or the time of jesus or you know folks from that that axial age or you know any earlier time what amazing incredible you know lives where you know as we say you know on this smartphone <laughs> um you know you've got more more information than than you know, was in that we're in the computers the, going to the moon, you know, and, and, um, you know, just the information at our fingertips and everything, the, the internet, then, you know, I mean, the, the good and the bad and the ugly of that. Um, but how, how the world has changed, how we have changed. But if, as I think about it, I mean, I, I don't mean that it stayed static in a spiritual sense, but, um, but, we're still confronting the same challenges that people at the time of the Buddha were, challenged, uh, were, were facing. You know, they were facing it about, you know, their neighbor whose oxen has, you know, got into their crops and they're really pissed off about it. And we're pissed off about our, uh, you know, our colleague at work who's giving, you know, bad mouthing us to our other colleagues, you know, something, you know, the, the, the scenarios change, but, 
Um, but we we get hooked in the same way. Shempa is the same, you know, the Tibetan word. Um, our tangles are, 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 you know, are fundamentally the same, even though the packaging is is completely different. You know, so you know it's interesting. You know, what, what did um, what did Einstein say that we're we're like technological giants and and uh, moral or spiritual? I hope you have to get the word that's correct for this age. He might have used pygmies, but but you know, kind of whatever the the the, the current uh, nomenclature the, the, of you know of smallness of 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 um, of uh, yeah, that we're that that we've developed so little um, uh, in many ways over these times. Um, you know, the teachings have been elaborated through the ages, and you know, great wisdom teachers. And yet, you know, in terms of the the the, the world, I mean, if we look at you know Russia invading Ukraine, or we look at the number of people that are going hungry every day, while you know a few score people had billions of of dollars and the inequities and the and 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 climate change caused by human action all of that we see we see the manifestations of human suffering so the teachings are are the same teachings really um today um hopefully with the potential of of kind of manifesting them in a way that can not just bring inner healing and inner peace and inner freedom, but but real change in the way we live together in the world. You know that we that, and we see. You know we see the. You know really painful manifestations in our own society right now with the profound divisions. You know that 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 exist, and you know how easily we we find ourselves on one side of a. Of a, of a war, you know, of a conflict, um, you know, and how do we hold, you know, caring about, you know, change and justice and equality and all the things, but do it in a way where, um, where we're not creating more suffering, we're not creating more harm, we're not bring, throwing more fuel on the fire. So that was another name of the talk to get day, ending the war, ending the war, um, what was the other one? I thought, um, um, peace in this moment. Um, only this moment is life was the one that was coming. But whatever the the the, the talk the, the the name is, um, that this present moment is is where uh, everything rests on how we meet meet this moment. And so, you know, coming back to just that that, that background that um, that. You know, reading Eckhart Tolle in the in the, over these recent days has been, um, yeah, you know, that the just a kind of it, it really enlivened and inspired my practice. And I, you know, probably I hope you know my teachings as well. Not you know, this is early days, I'm sure there'd be a lot of elaboration, but the the the, the it's it's a kind of diamond kind of wisdom i think you know it's, you can hardly go through a page where you don't say yes yes and it's completely within the the frame of you know it, you know it's he doesn't call himself a buddhist or a christian or a jew or a anything a muslim or anything else but um but the teachings are so um so much within all of those wisdom traditions and certainly within the teachings of the dharma you know it's it's really it's really it's really dharma dharma all the way down as it were so you know so i wanted to 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 kind of share some reflections um you know on this theme today and i'll, I'll probably quote a fair bit because you know there's some some incredibly powerful um just you know sentences and paragraphs that um That are worth kind of sitting with for a, for a, for for some time. So, some some things that I want to really get across, and um, you know, as I've been saying a couple of times already, now how we meet this moment, 
And as I'm talking right now, you know, I'm, I, I'm not wanting to talk just conceptually about, you know, now, <laughs> which is a, seems like a kind of a paradox or a contradiction, but, but really invite an, an awareness, an inner awareness of your experience, you know, Toll, when he, when he, when he speaks about, you know, if you're, if you're working on, you know, writing something, you know, can you keep an awareness where, yes, you've got to do thinking, you know, what am I going to say next? What do I want to do? But keep an equal or greater attention on what's going on inwardly, you know, when he sometimes calls the inner body, you know, be aware. And as I'm talking now, you can, you know, easily, hopefully, take in the words and the ideas and the, you know, what, what might be helpful that's being shared, but really take it in, you know, from the body and from the heart, you know, as well as on the kind of more everyday mind kind of way. So this present, the, mo the present moment is the doorway to freedom. That when we're suffering, when we're suffering, when we're experiencing suffering, we're always in some way moving away from the present moment. We really can't suffer in the present moment. You know, in the way that we talk about, the way that the Buddha talks about suffering, the way Toll and other, you know, whatever wisdom traditions, you know, from a standpoint of Dharma, you can't suffer in the present moment. Inherently is a resistance to an avoidance of the present moment. For example, if I'm worried about the future and I'm stressed out, I'm fixating on what's going to happen. How am I going to be able to do all this? It's so much. It's too much. I'm all on my own doing this. I'm never going to do it. I'm going to fail. You know, all of these stories in my mind, where is one place that I am not when I'm doing this? The one place I'm definitely not is in the present moment. I'm in the stories of my mind, which is in the future. It's the present isn't OK. So the future maybe will be OK if only I can do enough to make it happen. So I'm moving into the future to create a better future. I'm not present with what's here right now. So when we're suffering, if there is that suffering, we can come back to the present moment and we can say, OK, what am I aware of right now? I'm noticing, for example, hypothetically, I am noticing I'm really tight. My body's tight. I'm in a fight or flight place. I'm my my chest is tight. My belly's tight. My breathing's short. I'm feeling, you know, anxiety moving through me, that energy of kind of a fear energy moving through me. There's lots and lots. I'm noticing lots of stories proliferating in my mind about this will happen and then this will happen and then this bad thing will happen. And I'm caught up in that. But I'm noticing that now. I'm not then caught up in that, that proliferation. I'm, I've brought it into awareness. And when I bring that into awareness, I'm actually not suffering. There may be tightness. Yes, there's tightness. There's tension. There's heat in the face if I'm angry. But I'm no longer suffering. I've moved out of dukkha. I've moved out of suffering into awareness. Whenever we bring consciousness to suffering, we actually dissolve the suffering. Now, that doesn't mean in two minutes or two seconds we might not be back in the story and back in the mind and back in the clinging and back in the suffering. But again, we can come back again. It told, the way, one way Tol puts it is, and I, I think I want to read you this, the, the, the actual paragraph because it's, it's a really powerful one. He says,
Realize deeply that the present moment is all you ever have. Make the now the primary focus of your life. That's worth pondering on. You know, ask yourself, and I'll ask myself as well, how much of your life are you making, am I making the now the, the, the primary focus of my life? How much am I caught up in, I've got to do this, I've got to accomplish this, I've got to get somewhere. I'm leaning into the future, or I'm judging myself for the past, or that I'm angry with somebody in the present that's taking me away, you know, from my direct experience. How much of my life, how much of your life am I actually making making the present moment, making the now the focus of my life. And he goes on to say, always say yes to the present moment. This is really fundamental, isn't it? Because a lot of the time we're actually wanting to say, I want to say an expletive, but we'll fill that in the blank. Screw that, you know. I don't want to be with this. This feels crappy. This feels really horrible. What he's saying is always say yes to the present moment. What could be more futile, more insane than to create inner resistance to something that already is? What could be more futile, more insane than to create inner resistance to something that already is? So it's already here. You know, you could say that it's inevitable if we understand that to be like unavoidable. It's unavoidable because it's here. You know, this is here. You know, if X is elected president, X, this will be the here that we have to deal with in that particular moment. We have to be careful of how we deal with it in this moment, you know, deal with it, whatever the potential is and engage wisely and compassionately. But it will be the reality, the, 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 the kind of the isness of the situation. What could be more insane than to oppose life itself? What could be more insane than to oppose life itself? How often, and this is my parenthetical, how often are we opposing life itself? Whenever we're going away from our direct experience, here and now, we're actually opposing life itself. Sometimes it's everyday unconsciousness. It doesn't feel that harmful. And sometimes it's what Toll calls deep unconsciousness, where we really are wrapped around the axle, where we're really tangled, we're really hooked on something, and we're creating suffering for ourselves, perhaps for others. What could be more insane than to oppose life itself, which is now and always now? Surrender to what is. Say yes to life and see how life suddenly starts working for you rather than against you. So surrender, say yes to life. Now, probably if I were to do a brain scan, a number of people <laughs> in the future, it might be possible through AI or something, the kind of what's going on in people's minds. You know, a lot of people might say, well, what about things that need to change? What about things that do need to change in the world? Are you just saying, oh, or is Tall or Buddha or whatever saying, you know, just accept blah, 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 just Pollyanna-ish accept what it is? No, that's not the acceptance that any of them are talking about. You know, it's not that acceptance. It's not like... that somebody's, you know, killing somebody else to just kind of walk by, no, oh, that's life, you know. It's no, not at all. It's accept the truth of your experience here and now. You know, if anger's present, anger is present. If grief is present, grief is present, you know. If clinging is pre present, clinging is present. And if we can bring that into the light of awareness and pause right now and say, what is present? Can I... Can I open to this? Can I say yes to this? Can I say yes to this moment? Can I meet this moment without judgment? This moment in the heart space where everything that is is welcome. 
I don't want to read one more one more quote and then kind of more a few more general things. And this is an this is something that I'm not going to try and finish up today, but kind of get get the the the, the ball rolling on. You know what what about those situations where life seems you know feels really unacceptable where it does feel really really terrible really awful what do we do in that that situation this is how Tom puts it he says he's asked a question the present moment is sometimes unacceptable unpleasant or awful and then he responds it is as it is observe how the mind labels it and how this labeling process this continuous sitting in judgment creates pain and un unhappiness so what are the add this is me uh, adding on what are the add-ons what are the second arrows that we're adding on to this experience by watching the mechanics of the mind you step out of its resistance patterns and you can then allow the present moment to be this will give you a taste of the state of inner freedom from external conditions, the state of true inner peace. Then see what action, if necessary or possible. Accept, then act. Whatever the present moment contains, accept it as if you had chosen it. Always work with it, not against it. Make it your friend and ally, not your enemy. This will miraculously transform your whole life. There's so much in there that, but this sense of acceptance from acceptance can come wise action in the world, in our lives, in our families, in our work, etc. Wise and compassionate action that brings kindness that doesn't bring more suffering into the world but if i act from a place of non-acceptance what inevitably i do is i bring more suffering into the mix i create more suffering if i react whether in person or in my own mind or in my own relationships to somebody who i think is doing harmful things that's they're such a jerk i hate them they're causing such thing and i do that then i'm just compounding the suffering i'm just continuing the war we have to end the war and then we have to end the war ending the war has to come from within it has to come from within i remember being down on the mall in washington in 1998 i think it was 1998 and there was a campaign to end the land you know end landmines you know stop putting them in the ground wonderful asian teacher Arj um um gosananda arjun not arjun but gosananda um, um maha gosananda there and i remember he just did a short thing he said before we uproot the landmines from the ground. He was on the steps of the capital there. He said, before we uproot the, the, the landmines from the earth, from the ground, we must uproot the landmines from our own hearts. And I remember that. I remember that just listening to him, somebody translating him. And, you know, and it's, that's the essence, really, of this. It has to come from our actions in the world have to come from that, that place of compassion and acceptance. Or else we're going to just be, you know, reproducing suffering, meet the new boss, same as the old boss, as the who said, you know, of just more and more suffering. So, um, so. I, I think I, just time-wise, I'm, I'm going to one, need to move towards um, winding up, but and and have Emily lead us in some movement. But um, just for a cu couple of last uh, things, maybe to share. Um, you know, one thing is whenever we get caught up in time, we suffer. You know, when we, you know, if we if, when we go into the future. I don't mean just in a, what can be a skillful way of looking for at our week ahead or what we're going to do over the next year or what we'd like to develop. That's that can be skillful and helpful. But when 
when we get caught up in what Toll calls psychological time. He talks about this and a nice kind of difference. He, he makes a difference between clock time, which we all need clock time to operate in the world. I'll meet you tomorrow for coffee. I'll, I, you know, I've got a plane to catch to go to London on next Monday at this time. I better be in the right airport at the right time. That's all good stuff. You know, I don't want to go to the wrong airport. I only did it once, I'm sure. Maybe we've all done it once. It's a tough one. Um, clock time is fine you know we need that the but what he calls psychological time is where time becomes in a way time becomes the enemy time becomes i need this we're leaning into the future or we're leaning into the past so so when we when we caught up in psychological time when we're caught up in worry any kind of fear there's time involved and we're getting hooked on on the future you know, looking back into the past for things, the bad things have happened there as well. So the solution, it's always, always come back. What's alive? What's here right now? And here is where we find where we experience suffering and we experience the end of suffering, as, as the Buddha said. All of the Four Noble Truths really are contained in this fathom long body and really in this moment we find suffering or maybe it's not here for right now maybe we're filled with joy we're filled with hope you know we're filled with compassion for for the suffering of the world you know but for most of us even if we do have those moments we also get sucked back into the dukkha we get sucked back into the future the past we get sucked back into the mind becoming like in a way becoming becoming an enemy you know the mind there's nothing wrong with the mind the mind is a wonderful a wonderful tool a wonderful vehicle um this is what Toll says. He said, the mind is as a superb instrument if used rightly. Used wrongly, however, it becomes very destructive. Probably all of us can see here where, where the mind, our own mind has become destructive to us. We've got hooked. You know, a number of you know that I got kind of wrapped around the axle in the fall of like getting stressed out, teaching all the way through the pandemic and just not seeing some of the signposts and getting, you know, getting caught up in stress and actually having to kind of stop and say, you know, take time away and really learning from that experience. You know, we, we really can learn from our suffering. Our suffering can be a great gift to us if we if we uh, if we use our suffering to to learn from it, um, so yeah, being taken over by the mind. So so the the way out is always coming back. It's coming back to this moment. Um, coming back to what am I aware of? Seeing when we do get hooked, and you know, ultimately we can. There is, the Buddha said, there is an end to suffering. We can end suffering completely. But for most of us, it's a journey, letting go a little, letting go a lot. You know, moving towards that ultimate letting letting go. And reading Toll's book again, it's like, it's, it's wonderful to see somebody be able to talk about the depth of his suffering that really gave rise to his you know, his awakening of, of his freedom, you know, and just to read about him, you know, it, you know, he, I think early on, he says, um, he said, I spent almost two years sitting on park benches in a state of the most intense joy, state of the most intense joy, and then kind of gradually coming back, you know, coming back into, you know, people realizing he might have something to offer, and then kind of taking on a role of, of teacher, but then, you know, holding that lightly too, because it's all, you know, if you hold anything, I'll hold on to anything, you create dukkha, you know, and you get very wise people who have very deep awakenings who can get caught up in, in, in thinking there's something that is real and none of it is real you know it's all it's all impermanent it's all changing none of it is is none of it is really ourself 
So what I'd like to do is just finish by saying to inviting you to, you know, over the week ahead, notice where, where you are. Are you here aware of your experience in this moment? You know, are, are you in what the, what Toll calls the now? Are you in the present? Are you aware of your experience? Whatever the experience is, are you here? Or are you somewhere else caught up in the future, in worry, in fear, or the past, in rumination, or judgment, or anger, um, or distraction, or daydreaming, or whatever? Are you somewhere else? And if you are somewhere else, again, just to invite, take that as a mindfulness bell to come back to this moment. What am I aware of? Come back. You know, peace is this moment without judgment, this moment in the heart space where everything that is, is, is welcome, as uh, Dorothy Hunt says. You know, and I share, often share that, that image of the, you know, because I think it's a powerful one of the, the the horse, you know, galloping along, you know, at top speed and somebody shouting out to the, you know, shouting out to the rider, where are you going? And the rider shouts back, don't ask me, ask the horse. And, you know, I just find that that little vignette, you know, such a powerful thing because, you know, such a powerful image of our own minds or metaphor for our own minds, how much of the time the horse, the unconscious mind is driving us, is in control, and how mindfulness, how coming back to the present moment is a way of kind of like kindly and compassionately taking the reins again not in an overly controlling way and kind of going, moving things in a direction that will be skillful, that will be beneficial, that will be wholesome, that will serve ourselves and serve others in the world and that, that will create greater well-being. You know, to be, you know, we, there's a, a lovely image that, uh, that Toll uses in The Power of Now, you know, about the role of... <clears throat> The role of teachers, and and I'm using that. I'm using it. He was as well, not just spiritual teachers as such, but the way we can all be, we can all have that light within us shining. And he uses the image of of you know how somebody can affect another person. And he gives the image of of a, a fireplace with a log that is burning really brightly, you know, really fully burning, you know, really alive and another log which is not so burn and so so alive you know just kind of more in a kindling kind of phase how the proximity of that one to that other one will be affected and it will it will enlighten and illuminate and inspire that log that is maybe less less kind of burning and you know, what all of these wisdom teachings say, and if they don't say this, they're not, I don't think they're really wisdom teachings, is that each one of us has that spark of enlightenment within us. You know, each one of us has the Buddha nature. You know, what the Quakers call each one of us has that of God within us, whatever language we want to use. We all have that. And we can be that for others. You know, in our families, we don't have to preach, you know, a lovely story of a woman at a retreat asking, you know, from a fundamentalist Christian family saying, you know, you know, recognizing, she says, when I, when, you know, at first going back into a family and telling her about Buddhism, they don't want to know anything about it. And then she recognized, she says, they hate me when I'm a Buddhist. They love me when I'm a Buddha. You know, it's that, that recognition. So it's kind of a lovely story that, you know, if you can be that, not te not, you know, have it as words or as a, you know, some some window dressing or a shingle that you put out, but just to embody that, then other people will be affected by your light. You know, you know, and and and, and that we all, you know, much as I wasn't a supporter of um 
of uh, of the policies back then i remember the the uh, the thousand points of light <laughs> is actually a nice image you know of kind of we can be these points of light you know and others can be that for us and we have those who have been and maybe are that that for us and we can be that for others and it's not through being in any way a self or a role or an image but just through how we live our lives in the world and it really comes through this being present with our experience it can't really come in any other way we can't get it from books can we we have to get it through our direct experience books can be helpful and teachers and teachings can be helpful they can point the way but they they can't be anything to hold on to what the wisdom has to come and the compassion has to come from within so anyway there's 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 probably at least a dozen talks on this but i'll leave it here for now um i hope that there's something that kind of that that, that you can connect with uh, in this and anything that's not helpful leave on the cushion there with you and i will continue in uh, i'll be back in a couple of weeks um uh, i think catherine's going to lead next uh, next week and um and really continue on this 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 theme of the present moment and um yeah, invite you to, to, to kind of use that practice of coming back into presence, coming back into, into the now. So thank you for your kind attention, and I hope some of that was helpful. And uh, Emily, um, Emily will now uh, lead us in some movement and yes. we'll just have some announcements at the end. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Hugh. And I would like to invite you to listen to the wisdom of the body. You can stand up or maintain your seat, whatever works for you. And then notice shifting your weight from side to side, allowing yourself to feel grounded. And then open up. Just swaying, feeling the air against your arms as you move to one side and the other, allowing your gaze to change to one side and the other. And then open up wide, embracing here and now. Lifting your arms up to reach and exhale, soften your shoulders, soften your elbows. Grasping your left wrist in your right hand, tilt over to your comfortable place. Breathing into your left rib cage. Exhale, softening that left shoulder, tilting perhaps a little further or not. And inhale up, switch wrists, leaning over to the left, lengthening that right side, softening the left shoulder, finding your comfortable place. Inhale up, float your arms down and roll your shoulders together. Now switch directions and bring your arms up into cactus arms. Exhale, float your hands down, elbows stay up. Inhale, rise, lifting your head and chest. Exhale, down. Inhale, up. Last time, tilting your head down. Then rise, extend your arms out, flip that left palm up, take a look. And on the inhale, switch to your right, the left goes around, back to the left, to the right. Allow your arms to drop, you roll your shoulders independently, shifting, noticing. 
and then roll them the other way. And now come to center. Allow your feet to come beneath your hips and I'm turning so I, you can see placing your hands above your knees, extend out into a flat back. Lengthening your spine, noticing just how your hips and legs meet, where that bend can be, a safe bend, a comfortable bend, and then lower. Just allow the pull of gravity as you drop your hands, drop your arms, shoulders, lengthening your the back of your head. Breathing into the ribs, exhale, soften and allow, relaxing, noticing, pressing on your feet, noticing the soles of your feet, the strength of your legs, holding you strongly in the moment. And then place your hands above your knees. Tuck under your tailbone. Roll, roll up the vertebrae of your spine stacking. And lift your shoulders around your ears, exhaling them softly down. Lifting your arms up. Place your palms together above your head. Find your center. Finding a gaze in front of you. And then draw those hands to your heart. Centered again. Down, sending your centeredness, groundedness, and kindness out to the group as you turn your hands out. Down to the earth appreciating its abundance and on an exhale or is it an inhale inhale come up over your head back down to the heart sending out to the group your appreciation down to the earth and inhale up and then down to your heart. Take a moment to bow, appreciating everyone here. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. That was beautiful. Thank you. I really appreciated it. I'm sure everyone else did. Thank you. Um, what we'll do, um, it, we, because we only have five minutes, is we will um, we'll have uh, a time after 12 for those who would like to stay or and can stay to follow up and have any discussion um until i have to be gone by 12 30 but i can stay till then and obviously if people want to stay longer depending on if we can keep room open we'll we can do that um And so we won't have questions for right now. I will do as I'll share um, an announcement. A couple of things that I have coming up. Just point out, Karen has kindly shared in the um, a couple of things in the um, in the chat. Um, I, two things I wanted to mention. One is that Rebecca and my partner and I are teaching a day-long retreat on July 29th at Iona, Iona Senior Centre in Tenley Town. That's an in-person event uh, not far from our old Centre for Mindful Living. Really looking forward to that. Thank you for sharing that in the chat, Karen. And also, um, I have a six-week course coming up, which is kind of, um, I'm really looking forward to six Tuesdays beginning on September 19th on um, I call it broadly freeing the heart, but I'm looking at all the teachings of the Four Noble Truths, the Four Foundations of Mindfulness, and the Four Brahma Viharas, which are kind of at the very heart of the Buddha's teachings, and just kind of looking at the, the big picture of those teachings and their relationship to each other, not all at 
the 30,000 feet level, but really kind of diving down into some of the core practices as well. So I hope you can join. That will go, that, that, that will, registration will begin sometime next month for that one. But I just wanted to give a heads up on that. And also just to mention, as we do each week, that there's no cost for joining the class um, the, on Sunday. Um, you're invited if you're able and inclined to do so to make a donation, a dana, a generosity. It's how the teachings have come down through two and a half thousand years. And uh, it's a tradition and a practice that we're committed to continuing. So thank you for your support. Um, again, Liz here wholeheartedly. And appreciate your effort today in coming here and practicing together. Just holding everyone here, all of us together, you know, the power of Sangha, of community, how we support each other in our practice. May our practice may our time together be of be of benefit to to all beings being all beings near and far all in the different realms may all beings be free of suffering may all beings know deep freedom of the heart <laughs> 